Hi, welcome to Signals from the Hill. I'm Kat, I do marketing for Avery Hill Publishing. In this episode, I'm talking to Tom Humberstone about his new book, Suzanne, the Jazz Age Goddess of Tennis, which came out last week. Suzanne is just one of several great books we've published this year. Head over to averyhillpublishing.com for more information. The books are available through all good book and comic shops and digital editions can be found on our Gumroad store. And now here's my chat with Tom. So I'm here with Tom Humberstone, the uh, creator of Suzanne, um, and you've just come off, you've just come back from London where you had two launches for the book, and there's another one coming up soon <laughs> in Edinburgh where you're based. Um, that's quite a, that's quite a good launch kind of couple of weeks, I reckon. Yeah. I don't know, know Avery Hill have ever done that many launches. Really. <laughs> I've been greedy. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, I think, yeah, we set up the one with Gosh and then I I spoke to Portobello Books about maybe doing one for, for Edinburgh and then the uh, Wimbledon bookshop one sort of you you sort of helped set mm. that up as well. So well they're all to... they're all quite different, which is quite nice. Because you're gonna be doing for the Edinburgh one a bit of a kind of talk in front of the audience. So yeah, each one's been quite different. Yeah. Um so in talking to you about your work, I kind of decided I might want to go back a little earlier than Suzanne and come back to Suzanne later, because I've listened to a few podcasts you've done. You've done quite a few already, um, which is brilliant. Um, but I'm quite interested in kind of your how you got into comics and things and your your route into it. And actually before this morning, before, while I was kind of writing down ideas for things to talk about, I suddenly put something together in my brain, which was that. I think I read your blog years and years and years ago when I was just getting started in comics and it was quite inspiring to me oh. <laughs> and quite helpful. I think I think I remember reading something you'd written about being interested in subscription models for putting out comics and I was interested in that too and I remember reading that and it was kind of the inspiration for doing my series of zines that I that I started out doing. Um, and I think also I came across Richard Bruton, the comic reviewer, um, via your blog as well. And he was possibly my first kind of small press review that I got finding him through your blog. So that's quite cool. Oh, wow. Um, that's really cool. Um, yeah, this morning, I just suddenly thought, I, I think that was Tom, actually, whose <laughs> blog I read all those years ago. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, that's really cool. I um, Yeah, I remember writing that about the subscription model. It was for a, um, yeah, like a, a, a small sort of series that I was planning on doing called Ellipsis, which I ended up abandoning mainly because uh, I don't think that whole idea of like a subscription model of having lots of people hopefully sort of buy into the, the book and the idea. Mm. Um, uh, it yeah, it doesn't really work if if you don't get lots of people uh, buying it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, I, uh, I I did kind of try it. I did eight issues of my zine, and it worked really well initially. But I just found that every issue kind of the sales dropped off slightly from the previous one. Um, and yeah, and then the subscriptions for the second year, I did it over two or three years, were kind of lower than the first. And I just, it was just quite obvious it wasn't going to be a sustainable thing. Um, it worked really well initially. It got, got me a, a nice bit of kind of income to fund the first, you know, few print runs or whatever. Um, yeah. And I don't feel like it was a waste, a waste of time. Like I love my zines that I made and I and they gave me an opportunity to practice comics a lot. Yeah. But um yeah, just it is it is interesting to look at these things. And I wondered if you could talk about um solipsistic pop a bit, because that was another thing I came across early on where that was I think maybe the first time I came across your name. Could you talk yeah. about that project a bit? Yeah, so that was something I um started in 2009 and I'd um I've been doing like a few small press books around just a, like a two or three years prior to that. Um uh, collections of like I started doing comics um, about being at art school when I was at art school um, and collected those when I finished I spent a couple of years working in film just as a runner in wow. production uh, post-production places um, uh, but I was always doing comics on the side but sort of I started taking it a bit more seriously a few years down the line and I think it was yeah I 
I'd started doing like autobio comics around sort of 2005, 2006. And then a friend and I, who was a journalist, uh, Dan Hancock, we traveled around America in 2008 following the presidential primaries. And I would draw oh, wow. um, people we met and the experiences we had, and he would write about it. And we had this ongoing blog. And we put that book out in 2008. And all of that time I was thinking it would be really nice to do a, a sort of version of um, McSweeney's, I guess, was the sort of inspiration or raw. Um, something that was a beautifully produced, beautifully printed collection of UK comic artists and that sort of, um, yeah, just looked and felt as good as something like raw. Um, yeah, McSweeney's were particularly like, you know, at that time they were doing like the newspaper edition of McSweeney's where yeah. it had all of those different inserts. And, mm. um, yeah, and so I just thought it'd be really nice to try and make something like that happen here. Um, and it was around that time that I was getting to know the small press scene of the UK and it just felt like there were so many good people. And I, I sort of knew a lot of people who were doing comics but weren't part of the UK scene, um, not not necessarily going to conventions, but were sort of on the periphery. Um, and uh, yeah, just wanted to start collating all of that. And um, it was a really amazing experience. I did four of them in the space of, I think the fourth one came out 2011. So it's, yeah, probably came out like twice a year or something like that. Mm. Um, and yeah it was incredible it wasn't um sustainable like I, um <laughs> just the amount I, of work I, that you you had to do to produce it was well, that there was that but um yeah and it definitely made me put my own work aside and I, I sort of took over the editing of it all and I designed it and liaised with the printers and got all the back going and the marketing and it was good to sort of be involved in all of those different parts of the process and I felt like I could be quite a good uh, lobbyist for it in, in, in that I wasn't selling my own work. So mm. it felt much easier when I was at conventions yeah. to talk about it and sell it to people because I, I could, um, I could be sort of quite full throated about it. Instead, you know, whereas yeah. if it's my own work, I'm like, oh, you might want to buy this. It's not very good. Yes. Though, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Actually, I was I was chatting to your brother about that at the the launch in Wimbledon. How just how much easier it is to to promote something when it's not your own work um, yeah absolutely and the but idea yeah, that, I mean, oh sorry oh I was just going to say that I, I can't remember who it was I was talking to but we came upon the idea one time doing um sort of comic fairs and festivals that it would be great if everyone could just swap tables because then you <laughs> could just, it's so much easier if you ever mind you know watch over someone's table while they're away it's so fun you're kind of going saying to people this look at this it's amazing and you would never say that if it was your own yeah own no, absolutely. oh it's so bad as well I remember um speaking to uh Rebecca Kieran who um does sort of you know like imagey image comics and mm -hmm. you know quite big and I think he had that same uh delivery in america and uh, american cons and i had various other oh, comic wow. creators come up to me and say you've got to stop doing that <laughs> you're making people feel bad for buying your own work like um oh. which is the side of it but i'd never really thought about which has been you know someone comes up to you and says oh, i was such a big fan of this and and if you go, oh, yeah, I can't look at that anymore or something, you're, you're sort of saying, oh, you're stupid for liking that, or, you know. Yeah. So you've got to, yeah, there's a part of it you do have to get over, I suppose. But um, <laughs> the other thing was um, with Soul, Soul Pop was just uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't really figured out a good business model for it. Like, mm. um, it, it, it did make its money back but it didn't really make much more than that. And then when it came to the fourth one, that one was really, really expensive to make. Mm -hmm. And I just turned freelance. So I didn't have like more, I basically, I, I was just putting a lot of my own money into it. Mm. Um, and that was much easier when I had a full-time job. And then when I was just starting out as a freelancer, it was sort of unsustainable. So unfortunately, I had all these plans for the fifth one, and 
and I sort of had ideas about what I was going to do for the set and uh, they all got tabled and uh, I thought just tabled for a couple of years but it's like 10 years later now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I because I think anthologies are fantastic um, but I think it's a common experience that people making them you know run out of steam after a few issues because it's just the amount of work is crazy I mean I think they're fantastic for that reason um, that you said of um, you can kind of collect people's work together in a way where people will discover each other's work and people new audiences will find new creators because they're seeing things that they wouldn't necessarily have found um otherwise um and everyone can kind of help promote it everyone brings their own audience to the the, the product um but yeah the amount of work is crazy um I edited Tiny Pencil which was an anthology for a few years and we had the same realization which <laughs> just like this is not sustainable yeah. um, but yeah, it's great that that they do, you know, happen every now and then and that they're, I don't know. I don't know what would be a way to do it where it would be sustainable. <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about it recently um, as something I might want to do as my next project. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, not not as a, a consistent thing, but just as, as a, as a one-off book. Um, and yeah, I, I mean... I think for me, the thing I'm thinking is um, arts council funding. <laughs> so, you know, like, uh, um, but yeah, I, I don't know because yeah, you also don't want to um, be asking people like I did at that that time to be asking people to do things for free, which is what I was doing. Um, definitely, this time I want to make sure, like you know, there would be like page rates and things. So, mm. so yeah, it can be um, yeah, it can be tricky. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, like you were saying, that you were aware of people making comics that weren't sort of in the scene necessarily, because <laughs> that's how I kind of felt at that time. I think it was around 2010. I just started making small press stuff um, and I kind of wanted to get into it. And I would come across things on on Twitter of people referring to like the London small press scene and things. And I would think, how do I find that? I don't know. I don't know where it is. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So coming across things, it, it was ma mainly going to comic events, I think, that made, gave me the contacts and things. Um, I made friends with Katie Green, who I think had a piece in one of your solipsistic pots um, very early on. And so, um, yeah, it was, I think, mostly attending events. If, I, if ever anyone asks me, you know, how to make contacts and things in comics, I always recommend going to <laughs> in-person yeah. events because they're brilliant for that. No, oh, it's so true. Like, yeah, I think that's, you, you almost have to sort of accept, um, you know, there's going to be like booking hotels and booking trains and the tables mm. that, and then publishing whatever you're going to be taking. It's quite a big outlay, but um, that's, that's the thing that you're, I think you're hopefully going to be able to get out of it, which is just to meet other creators and make connections. Like, Looking back at those uh, soul pops is very, um, it's like a real, it feels to me like a real snapshot of where the scenes were then and who who was making the work. And um, yeah. and also like so many of those people who I didn't know very well and I approached because I liked their work, um, you know, ended up being friends and, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a real, um, yeah you know, it's sort of a, a moment of all of our lives as well. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so you sort of, you were, you, for, have I got this right? You were kind of making comics a bit before you then sort of turned pro as an illustrator. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I've been doing like bits of illustration work. Um, so I worked, I was working in film for a couple of years. Um, and then I worked as a graphic designer for a few years after that. And during that, that time, I would, I would occasionally get illustration work um, that I would be doing in the evenings or on weekends. Um, and it just sort of got to a certain point when I thought, I think I have enough clients or people who I, who I work with that I can make a go of this. Um, I also was able to like uh, do a um, sort of soft launch of that in terms of um I could do a couple of days a week uh doing graphic design work mm. and then so I didn't go immediately into it um mm. 
but it, it definitely was quite a tricky few first few years um of of um you know just building up that client base and also like i don't know <laughs> oh this is always the case though i guess when we talk about our own work and stuff but like I look back at some of the work I was doing then. I'm not sure if I would have hired me, but um, <laughs> like, yeah, same. I have that. <laughs> yeah, like that's, that's the way I guess. Like you can't look at it like that, but um, but yeah, like uh, yeah, but, uh, but I, I haven't sort of gone back. It's been yeah, just over ten years now. So, uh, right. Yeah, I, I think I turned full time freelance just before I turned thirty, and I just turned forty one. So it's been, oh. yeah. Yeah, happy birthday. Oh, yeah, thanks. Was it, was it last week, your birthday? It was, yeah. <laughs> Just the uh, day before I came down to London to do oh, the right. painting for gosh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I was going to ask you, how was the experience of doing the window painting? Because the yeah. thought of that has always terrified me. Because I, <laughs> yeah. I draw very, very small. And the thought of having to produce something on that scale. Yeah, I don't think I'm in that. Yeah, because it feels quite sort of, uh, gregarious and extrovert to sort of like do something on, on a large scale like that and um that doesn't feel like me either but uh yeah it's all right it was really um I felt very hot um, <laughs> uh, and I was like um you know you're in this quite tight enclosed space with the books behind you yeah yeah and so you're you um uh you're just sort of uh and then it's like you're putting paint onto glass and realizing, oh, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I sort of haven't really been using acrylic paints for, mm. I can't remember the last time I did. Um, and I've definitely never worked with glass. Um, and so you're like, oh, these are, these are materials and, and a canvas that I'm not entirely used to. Um, mm. And yeah, yeah, you just start coming across weird idiosyncrasies that um you, you're not prepared for like um putting some paint on and then I, I would get some like poster paint sharpies uh to try and tidy up some lines but as you're doing that what it would end up doing is just taking off the paint oh god and, and then it'd be really difficult to like get it back on and then you press a little bit too hard and then it would start the paint would just start dripping Oh, uh, down yeah it's, it was quite stressful but um I think it ended up coming out quite like fairly well but, yeah, yeah it looked lovely <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. yeah I think I was um I was uh, uh in between uh Tom Gould and uh Crom so I felt oh. like uh, quite a lot of pressure to <laughs> <do something laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, but that's that sounds like my nightmare. I don't like drawing in front of people with people watching me and then using a, a medium that I've never used before. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. it's not ideal. I think you you look <laughs> like you did very well. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. As you're doing it, you also notice people taking surreptitious photos of you as you part as they walk past. Like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm never going to see them. Uh, the, the the photos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I guess to get on to Suzanne specifically, um, I'm quite interested in um, the experience that you would have had. Um, from what I gather, you've done an, uh, an awful lot of sort of nonfiction comics, but you also do some poetry comics as well. That seems like quite a, an interesting sort of contrast. Um, and then to go on to a sort of full length nonfiction thing. First of all, what's the difference in approach between those two things, the sort of the poetry side and the uh, nonfiction side? Is it, it seems like it would be a completely different sort of way into it. Yeah, um, I guess with nonfiction, you have to be, um, I, I think you have to be quite precise with both, both of them, but there's a different precision with um the non-fiction you have to be quite uh, careful about your structure and um yours generally when i'm working with the nib say um i think there's like a cut off of say 30 panels has been generally found to be the kind of you know at the point at which sort of casual readers might lose interest and might sort of move on um so you want to try and generally get your point across within like a 30 panel comic um 
and you're also making that that will hopefully work on a desktop but also work on uh, uh, you know phones and, and tablets mm. as well and so you're sort of trying to figure out all sorts of different sort of compositional problems and, and things mm. uh, maybe take caption boxes and put them as their own panel mm -hmm. yeah. things you know so it can all sort of fit together um yeah it's a lot of tetris basically um and also yeah trying to sum up a complicated nuanced news story um uh as simply as you can um but yeah it's all quite you can never really turn your brain off and um you're always thinking very very intentionally about everything mm -hmm. it comes to the poetry comics um um you know there's uh, intention and intentionality there as well in succinctness but in very different ways so mm -hmm. generally I, I make them with uh Chrissy Williams who's a poet and mm -hmm. um, met and the first time we met I think we just ended up talking a lot about how um, we found all of these different similarities between comics and poetry and the ways in which, you know, you're trying to get at the heart of something in the fewest possible amount of lines and um, that there are specific uh, rhythms that you're trying to communicate to the reader, but mm -hmm. uh, both in both mediums, the reader's performing it. You're, you're not there to be able to say, no, no, it needs to be like this. Yeah. So you're you're trying to give it, all of these ideas to the reader about how it's you know how it's supposed to uh flow um mm. yeah so there's all, all of these like things and we just started experimenting with um how could we work on a poetry comic together that wasn't an illustrated poem which would be an entirely different thing mm. um, so yeah we tried all these different ways of doing it generally we've sort of come to this conclusion that Brucey will write the poem and maybe and separate uh, the lines that have to be on each page mm -hmm. and then maybe say on this page uh, give a general note of um, like a visual that, that which she has in mind um, but try to be as as vague and as as ambiguous about it as possible really mm. and then leave it to me to come up with what what i what i come up with really um so there's a lot of quite free association and it's fairly scary and it's probably the moments where i feel the most like i'm an artist rather mm. than sometimes like there are like with comics i feel more like a craftsperson at, at sometimes mm -hmm. um but this was like a real creative um letting go and i don't entirely feel in control of where it's going and then i look back and go oh, I, this makes no sense mm -hmm. or it made sense to me today but i don't know if it will tomorrow and um and it feels a little bit scary in that sense um uh certainly like putting it out there and seeing what other people make of it but it also feels free in and it's a sort of those are sort of comics I really like reading as well, like quite art art comics and abstract comics that really um may, maybe are, are a little non narrative in in that sense mm. um yeah, so they're two very different ways of working, and I quite like that they get to scratch different itches and yeah, 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 definitely I think. I think you and I are probably fairly similar in that what comes naturally to me is either autobio stuff like using my own life as you know the basis for an idea or research-based stuff um I really enjoy the process of research it's really it's a really fun part of the process because the, there's so many possibilities and you keep finding things and going oh this is great this is great mm -hmm. but you're not you're not yet having to do any of the actual yeah. work so you can actually almost get lost in the the initial research stage sometimes um, I love it though like yeah like you say it's um a yeah it's full of all of this possibility and like uh, you know the endless optimism of the beginning of a yeah. project but also <laughs> like um it feels like great like oh this is a great job I get to like find out about all of these different things like that's one of the reasons I really like the idea of going into editorial illustration for 
you know, my other side of my job is, um, because you, you know, you get sent articles you might not have read, uh, you know, and you get to, you know, you're, yeah. you're constantly encouraged to, and the same with like the, the nib comics and things like that. You know, you're always like on the lookout for interesting stories you might not come across and mm. you're kind of being paid to, to carry on learning, which is always nice. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think because I'm not a very, I'm not necessarily a very conceptual artist. The thought of doing editorial illustrations always scared me because sometimes you look at someone who's done an illustration for an article on, you know, a scientific topic or, a, you know, an something in economics or something. You think, how on earth did you think of a visual image? I don't, I don't really know how people do that. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I always feel bad when, um, like, uh, Eleni Carlicotti and, mm. and various other like yeah. Eleanor Davis as well is particularly good. Um, yeah. When I see their stuff for uh, like New York Times or whatever, and uh, yeah, I, I sort of question why I'm, <laughs> I'm a lot more. Literal. Yeah, they're yeah. amazing. <laughs> but I think I the what you were saying about the working more on the poetry side, and that's where it feels the most creative to you. I think that I've, I've had that feeling when I've kind of ventured into fiction a little bit more. Um, because you you suddenly think I'm really having to work to create something from nothing. Yeah. <laughs> when you start with a, a sort of nonfiction topic, you do all the research and you've got loads of starting points, and you you know you're almost spoiled for choice of what to what to do. Um, I think they're almost opposite processes. Like mm -hmm. doing a, a nonfiction piece, you're whittling down from all the possibilities to something focused, and then creating something that's fictional. You're kind of possibly starting with one tiny germ of an idea and then trying to grow something from it yeah. um, and yeah. that I found that process very scary at first but um, I'm kind of quite enjoying it now um, I'm not I'm not one of these people that has masses of story ideas all the time and I can't decide which one to do I'm always kind of I'm just working on one one idea and that's the thing I'm doing and I find it hard to come up with that initial idea but it can be something as simple as just a character or a, a setting and then it'll all kind of come out of that but that's definitely I think yeah where I have that feeling of like oh I'm actually doing creative work now <laughs> yeah I totally agree um uh I was saying this to to a friend recently like yeah that was the thing that was made was maybe ner most nerve-wracking about Suzanne was um I was able to do all of that research and really get uh, into the weeds on the structure and the outline and know exactly why various scenes needed to be where they were. And I could sort of uh, justify every every decision that I had made. And then when it came to the writing script, I was really terrified about the, yeah, like, how do I write these scenes I've, I've, start, I've invented? And, um, and how do I make them all flow and, and make sense? And, feel like the people that I've been reading about all this time but yeah that was the stuff I found the most rewarding and um I got so much out of and it definitely has given me more confidence to go forward with just writing pure fiction because I mm. I really enjoyed that part of it and I definitely felt like moments of sitting at my desk and couldn't wait to sort of just dive into the world and and yeah lose myself in these conversations and mm. it's really good fun yeah that's true actually because doing historical fiction that's really a mix isn't it between a between non-fiction and, and fiction and mm -hmm. yeah having to write dialogue that's of, of a certain period and also you I'm sure you felt great responsibility towards the character of Suzanne and wanting to sort of do her a good you know a good service with the writing so yeah. um I think I heard you on a, another podcast say that you like to work by sort of coming up with the complete script before you do any drawing work. Is that right? Is that what yeah. you do? With I mean, that's, not, that's definitely how I did it with Suzanne because it was such a big project. And I, I'd um, applied for Creative Scotland funding. So I had, uh, you know, money to, to keep me going while I worked on this, but also there was enough to be able to pay for an editor to work with me on it. Right. Just before I had uh, like Avery Hill uh, were involved. And so I um, I hired Larry Harris, who uh, edits my work at the MIB. And um, 
I knew that I wanted to be able to send her and various other friends and peers a version of the script and get feedback before I put pen to paper in terms of the actual drawing and just get a general sense that I wasn't making too many mistakes along the way and if there were any problems structurally that I caught those early before mm. I started too, too yeah. much the drawing. So yeah, I, I was um I was pretty uh you know stage based uh for, for the for this comic but it depends i guess i am s similarly with the nib i'm a little less so with um the poetry comics and that's a little bit more mm. uh, free form and there are definitely other projects i've done where i've i've just almost started drawing rough pen um thumbnails and and just playing around with panel compositions there before um before I've even started writing anything um but yeah I think I think that that had to be the case with Suzanne and it might need yeah I don't know going forward whether I'm going to do the same or not I guess it's just going to be case by case basis I don't know how about you how do you work yeah definitely I tend to type up at the the wording first and then do the artwork second I don't I don't feel like I get I don't feel like I love drawing particularly of it in and of itself. So the thought that I would waste time drawing stuff that then wouldn't get used is yeah. kind of unappealing. So yeah. I try to work out as much of it and get it as finished as possible in writing before I start drawing. And as you said, I'm, I like working with an editor very much and I like having a sort of script that's, I, I tend to, I think I write it like a screenplay. So there's quite a bit of visual description of what's happening what what you can see on the character's face in that moment or whatever and um so that it can be read by another person and, and understood um so I tend to write it like that as if I'm I'm writing a screenplay um and then come to the drawing later I like getting the decisions made early on um and not having and reaching a point where I feel like I'm not going to have to make too many more <laughs> and I can just oh, get that's on, interesting. like get on the grind of it because to me the drawing is a bit of a grind yeah um, I enjoy coloring a lot because I feel like I can almost go autopilot at that stage um and that's quite nice you can kind of you know have podcasts and have a film on while you work or whatever and you can just kind of not have to think at that point <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. Same, very much the same. Uh, even to the extent that, uh, yeah, when I was talking to Kieran on his podcast about the, mm -hmm. um, uh, I was always worried about decision fatigue further down the line. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And how if I could just, so all my pencils are pretty, uh, you know, tight pencils, and I lay on the lettering to make all the decisions about where all that, that needs to be. Mm. and I also lay in like rough colours and I would say you know there, there are all sorts of reasons for that because I think all of those are important to work together yeah and it's good to like get a general sense of are they all working well together what what things need to change mm. but also just generally like if I've made a lot of those decisions any doors later in the process I'm sort of thinking about the you know two years away Tom and yeah you know you just want that last sprint to be as as, <laughs> yeah. as possible <laughs> yeah I mean you, as the sole creator of something like a graphic novel you're almost like doing so many roles you're like a cinematographer you're kind of your design you're designing the costumes you're kind of doing absolutely everything down to the the tiniest detail of you know a person's facial expression in one particular moment and I feel like you're you're making so many small decisions. That's part of the reason I really like working with an editor and having someone have more of a big picture, be able to look at it and say, you know, have you thought about what, you know, what if this happened or what if you got rid of that bit or whatever? Because I feel like, like I get very focused on the minute details. Yeah. It's hard to maintain a kind of overview. Did you ever pick up the McSweeney's comic edition that was like, you know, probably about 12 years ago now or something no. but there was a introduction by Chris Ware in it um but I always think about when it comes to those things when he's just saying so you sit down and you write panel one and a man is sitting at his desk drawing and then you you have to start thinking okay well is he uh 
am I going to draw it side on or front on or from yeah. the back? Oh no, it's definitely side. It's definitely side. And is he is he hunched over? Oh, is he bored in? Why is he bored in? Oh, is it just because it's me? Am I drawing me? <laughs> and what sort of shirt is he wearing? Is he wearing a pink shirt? What sort of what am I trying to say with a pink shirt? Yeah. It, does it say anything? And <laughs> and sort of many sort of details, yeah. the how you sort of lose your mind by the end of the page. Um, yeah, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> I th yeah, I think that must be why um, I'm keen to do as much of that as possible early on. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. One thing I I particularly love in Suzanne, I've got a copy of it here, um, <laughs> is the the colouring because I love. I love working with the limited palette myself, but I find it really hard. <laughs> mm. um, I tend to, you know, throw a lot of colors at things. Um, and I think the way you've done it is, is so beautiful. Um, and I think sometimes people, I don't know, like it sounds simple working with a, a limited palette, but it's actually not very simple at all. Because even though you have your two main colors as sort of blue and red palette, there's other small colors that have to kind of creep in like hair color and and white as a color and you know it's it actually ends up being way more colors than it kind of looks like at first glance yeah um, but I think the way you've done it is so beautiful um thank you I, how uh, did how did you sort of work with that palette how yeah it, 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 yeah it's a really um I, I, I think I, I decided early on when it came to colouring, I'd always been quite scared of colouring um, in terms of I didn't know, like, any colour theory. Like, um, I had no sort of formal training in that sense. And I was, I think I was just scared of having too many choices. And so working with limited colour palettes made sense. But as I got better, Particularly when I worked on soul pops, um, I was working with printers, liaising with printers, and figuring out how to use spot colors and and working with because um, I couldn't afford to print on uh, CMYK because uh, that would be essentially paying for five plates of every mm. thing, and so we would work with two like black and a and a spot color. Um, and then I would get used to helping other people who didn't know how to work with spot colors, just generally give them a, a sense of how to do that, how to prepare the files. And so you're liaising with the printers and the artists and making sure all of that works. So I, I got a much better understanding of how to prepare work for print. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, that really gave me a, um, a much better understanding of how color works when it certainly when it comes to print mm. um, and that already limits the choices of colors that are available to you anyway um when it comes to the screen you've got millions available yeah um, so yeah i think after that you know i've worked with rizos and i've worked with um screen printing and dealing with overlaying colors really made me realize just like if you just have three colors, you could pretty much do everything you need to do. Mm. And by doing that, you also um, make the whole thing look a m much more co coherent than than if you had all the colors available to you. Particularly mm. when you were working at, with an anthology, it made all of that work by different artists look more coherent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was. Uh, so that's always been my way into it. Since then, I've, I've spent a lot more time reading about photography and, and cinematographers and, you know, when I like a, a film and the way it looks, I'll sort of try and dig into why and uh, mm. into, like, what it was about that and what worked for me. Um, I think I've always been quite obsessed with um, the magic hour and golden hour uh, colouring of... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, sunsets and sunrises yeah. I've always and I think that sort of comes across a lot in my illustration work is that yeah. that's the sort of colors that I am most interested in um yeah so when it came to this I knew it it was uh, going to be a mix of two colors but I didn't know what and then I, I think eventually landed on the this that specific red and blue 
because it, it worked well for it worked well for <clears throat> the heat of the Mediterranean and the French mm -hmm. Riviera and the um, and the clay that was the clay courts mm -hmm. and and the blues really worked well for the grass and the sort of grayness and and sort of um, cool colors of London and and various things and then the mix between the two and mm -hmm. as I just started experimenting with those two colors and. Uh, I would make like sheets of all the different color combinations that were available if I uh, just uh, used 10% uh, increments of every color and then how all of those would interact mm. um, and overlay, uh, particularly with the black as well. That gives you so yeah. many more options. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, that was really, it was really good because obviously it limits the amount of choices you have to make and decision making mm. does get limited but it also makes you be very very intentional about what you're trying to say with the colors and yeah um <clears throat> um yeah so like suzanne is often in red generally mm -hmm. because i i i thought that's the color that i most associate with her mm. um for various reasons but then it, it hopefully will say something to the reader when she's in blue because they'll subconsciously pick up on various things mm. um, like that hopefully yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I've I've learned a lot from printers over the years about color I remember a printer taught me about the selective color tool in photoshop which is a really useful tool <laughs> things like that when yeah when you you figure out technical stuff and you think oh this is really helpful <laughs> and yeah. it's also interesting like you were saying what your maybe what your ba art background is kind of plays into how you use color because mm. I had I had maybe more of a fine art kind of intro into it and there's certain things that I learned as rules of painting and stuff which don't gel with comics you know the way they're done traditionally like you don't use black if you're a painter that's one of the, the so-called rules and so to me I've never used black in my comics I my lines tend to be kind of sepia -y brown color mm. which I like I like the warmth of it and things um yeah. but it's just funny little things like that that I think turn into your your own particular style based on yeah. odd things that you've come across <laughs> so I think that's really good though because um when it comes to or a lot of the reasons why comics look the way they do, that's based on the limits of the printing processes yeah, in yeah. like early 20th century yeah, um, yeah. You know, American newspapers. So these heavy inked blacks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think the Hulk was green because of various reasons. Like the yeah, green, I remember green, hearing green, something. something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or like uh, the yellow kid was like a, a a paper, a thing in the the like a, a comic strip running in the paper, and that was all to show off the fact that they now could print in yellow. yellow. <laughs> so like all of these things, and like yeah, cross hatching and half tone, and all of those were to get around. Mm. You, know, you just used you could only use black, but mm. so a lot of those have stuck around. But we have like much better printers now, so like. Yeah, like you say, you know, there's no re you know, you can pretty much print a comic in in, in pencil and yeah, and... yeah, pencil art is is hard to reproduce really well, as I've discovered being primarily a pencil artist. Um, but now that I've gone into digital, it's a little you can kind of do art that looks like pencil, but um, isn't you're not necessarily trying to scan something off a textured paper, and you know that's all. That was a bit of a nightmare when I was illustrating and I was doing all traditional media stuff in pencil and watercolor and stuff. Um, uh, I just wanted to go back to when you were talking about the character of Suzanne wearing red a lot. It made me wonder what it was about her as a character that drew you to writing about her yeah uh, so I didn't know much about her until I um came across her in a tennis book that I was reading um and I, I found out all the kind of like headline bits and pieces about you know like uh she had this like 180 match winning streak yeah. um, she drank cognac at a change of ends uh, the way she dressed, you know, sort of inspired the flapper aesthetic and all of these sort of big 
things. And then the more I sort of delved into reading about her, um, there were all of these things about her relationship with her father and um, the cruelty of both of her parents and how they would um, withhold love and sometimes food or, 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 or um, yeah, any kind of affection uh, if she was playing badly mm. uh, and how that had an effect on her, the sort of spiky relationship with the press and, and yet all of her quotes and the the bits of her that come through that is that it, it, it is the stuff that's reported on is you know full of um sarcasm or or, or sassiness and and, and mm. funny witticisms and she's um she's that and then she also would like shout at umpires and uh and lines people and um uh, she she would have like quite a lot of you know arguments on the court and um, there would be a lot of uh, stress. I just found her a fascinating individual. I I think the more I read about her, the more I got to understand her or a version of her at least, because she never got to write about her life in in this way because uh, she, you know she died before she turned forty and so. You're often reading about her through other people's uh, words. Um, but you're trying to read between the lines about her as well and try and figure out who that person is. But yeah, I I definitely admired her a lot and respected her and felt sorry for her at times. But also, um, yeah, I don't know how, how I would have, got it along with her as well like I, I you know like I, yeah, I, yeah. I always like watching tennis players who are the underdogs so I think I I don't know if I would have been a fan at the yeah. time um, because uh, I I like to see I like to see the the, the players who often don't win to mm. uh, make a scrappy win um mm. so so there's that um but also yeah you know like just the time she she lived in was uh, so difficult for her and for women generally. And uh, yeah, it, there were just so many different fascinating aspects of, of mm. that story that were there to you know get your teeth into. Yeah, yeah. There's there's so much in the book. I'm I want to go back and reread now. I kind of skimmed through this morning preparing for this, but um. I, I just think it's one of those books that you could read it over and over and you'll keep finding new things, which is brilliant. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wondered if you'd seen the, you know, the uh, Netflix series Untold, which are sports stories, and there's one about M Marty Fish. Yeah. Have you seen that one? I saw that one, yeah. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah. It was a weird one. I... It was a, it's a really interesting story, but I also don't know how how much um, there's obviously a lot of learning in terms of the mental health side of things. Mm. But some of the phrases, and it's been so it was quite a while ago, but I watched it. But mm. some of the takeaways that he had, and some of the people talking throughout it had still had a little element of the toxic masculinity of you just gotta you know like his some of his takeaway was like oh i just had to like i just had to like deal with it and then uh really work hard and i don't know there was a, a sense that um there were all of these other aspects about the way the tennis culture had created all of these issues and problems for people that went almost completely unaddressed by the end yeah. I, but I don't know I, I need to go back and re-watch it because I don't know I can't I can't remember that yeah. now <laughs> um with that with that one I think I was mostly fascinated because it seemed like he um just had this moment where he decided to change his entire way of being from being more of the underdog like you were describing the sort of guy that wasn't winning a huge amount who you would kind of root for and he didn't seem super motivated to begin with you know he was kind of coasting a little bit and just suddenly had this 
moment where he thought, I wonder what I could do if I just went all in and kind of gave it everything. Um, <clears throat> and then did, you know, did things that that he wasn't super proud of and that made him, you know, made him unhappy just to kind of, just to see if he could do it. And I thought that was kind of really yeah. interesting. It's almost like two completely different personalities. Mm. Um, and the cost to him, you know, was so extreme of what yeah. he managed to achieve. Um, so I, I found it interesting, but also I do see that there's a very different tone between something like Suzanne and something like a Netflix documentary. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they, no. they, they do tend to sensationalize and, you know, make everything super dramatic and kind of, you know, your your book has this sort of understated uh, quality where you, you sort of definitely make, you seem to make the decision to not do that <laughs> and okay. to not sort of, you know, I think I, I heard another one of the podcasts talking about your book, maybe the Deconstructing Comics guys were saying, it seems like you made a lot of intentional decisions to not go into, not specify certain things, not go into certain things like the, the specifics of her health problems and her alcohol, you know, use and things like that, um, which yeah. I think is great. I think it's really nicely kind of judged in your book. Oh, thank you. I, um, I remember like I, I was already drawing it at this point, but um, so I'd, I'd made a lot of those decisions. But I remember the uh, Queen, Queen's Gambit came out uh, during lockdown while while I was working on it, and the way in which they deal, uh, obviously it's a fictional person, and it, I know it's based on a book, but um, there's a whole sort of addiction to drugs and alcohol element of that story. Mm. You keep expecting it to go down the sort of biopic, you mm. know, rise and fall based on alcohol, you know, and deal with the, you know, the almost kind of like Protestant, um, you know, puritanical kind of, um, and this is what happens if you, you, you know, you get involved <laughs> in drink, um, which you have in it, you know, every sort of, uh, certainly every musician biopic as well, you know, the, the, the drugs, uh, the cost of the drugs moment. Um, and I kept on waiting for it and it never happened in the Queen's Gambit. And there was some, there's a couple of other shows around that same time that I can't remember now, but I was realizing it was, um, it was almost like an intentional pushback on, I guess, the sort of trauma porn of yeah it, people sort of saying no to that now. And, um, it, it really made it clear to me that, um, yeah, that was something I was less interested in as well. Like, I, I think we, we get that, you know, she was having a hard time with her parents or uh, she was having a hard time with, uh, you know, maybe she was drinking a bit too much. But also, it's always, I, I don't think it necessarily had, it might have been something that led to the cause of her death but we don't know. Um, part of the reason I didn't go into too much detail about a lot of her health problems is also we don't know for sure what those were. Like, yeah. We only have what people said to go on and, and they didn't necessarily understand yeah. what, what she was going through. So, um, but it was like, it was also understanding, oh, yeah, these things were happening and that it's worth sort of uh, mentioning in off the cuff moments that mm. this is going on but it isn't the story that I'm interested in talking about or the part mm. of my life that I'm interested in talking about. yeah but yeah I guess it's always it's, as you know it's always about those um you know, making sort of almost reminding yourself of the stories the, the actual story you do want to tell and you know, you know I guess uh I don't know quite how far into the book you're doing right now you are and how you know how you sort of stop yourself from going down tangents and is, is that yeah yeah well it's all scripted and it's all written um so I'm I'm just uh sort of in the first stages of artwork um mm -hmm. yeah I I definitely make use of working with editors and I do get feedback and things um I think it just takes a bit of time like for you for things to come into focus it did for me with this book um this book is because my last book Breakwater which is my only other fiction 
project that I've done, I kept, I intentionally kept the story incredibly simple and the cast of characters very small. And I kept it a very small scale story because I thought that would be sensible for my first attempts. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this one is a little bit more, there's more storylines, there's more characters. Um, and so I did struggle to, I think, keep it all in focus. Um, but I think just over time, I would constantly sort of in the in the early stages constantly brainstorm ideas for some reason in the middle of the night was when I would have my brainstorms of ideas which is annoying mm -hmm. um, but I would just keep noting them down and I would keep starting to write little bits um, and it eventually it comes more into focus and you think um, I don't really need that I should focus on this more um, Ricky at Avery Hill has, has um, edited most of my work and he's brilliant and they're I would sort of show him the basic ideas and he would kind of give me really great suggestions like what if what if this storyline happened to that character instead of that one how does you know things like that where you kind of think oh okay I can mm. play around with things like that and and try and make the themes come kind of into focus and be clear um, rather than a jumble of ideas that I had initially so it's just a kind of gradual <laughs> process and it did it take took a bit of time of just living with the ideas and yeah, yeah. I, I definitely know that feeling uh yeah when you go to bed at night is when you sort of let your brain um decompress and go over everything and so it's that's suddenly the moment when you start getting ideas yeah <laughs> letting your, your brain sort of run off yeah <laughs> Thank goodness for for smartphones now. You can just kind of keep it by the bed and you can make notes quickly without having to get up and turn a light on. And stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I don't know if there's I've I've got more things on my list that I could talk about, but I guess um, this is probably a good amount of time. Yeah. I, I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about with the book. Oh yeah, I don't know. Uh, I this is a weird one that I was going to mention, but. I've realized I don't have any um it's not really come up naturally in 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 any any moments mm -hmm. of the podcast but um i I guess what what I've realized is there's this um when you're talking about a real character and and it's got this general um structure of a biopic um but it doesn't and you're talking about someone's life and trying to boil it down to some sort of uh, free act structure that is recognizable as a story mm. uh, i've been thinking a lot about what those sorts of stories are what the what they look like and uh i watched a maggie may fish youtube uh video essay recently mm -hmm. it was about um the problems with uh, Joseph Campbell, who wrote the hero with a thousand faces and is mm -hmm. largely the, uh, the basis for sort of all modern Hollywood blockbusters uh, sort of generally follow that sort of story circle. And um, it's a really good video essay, which is basically like this guy said he'd read all of, you know, like all different religions and all the different stories and they all come down to this one monomyth and um and here's roughly how you tell that story and that seems to have been accepted uh, you know mm -hmm. on a kind of large scale to the extent that you know when you read a screenwriting book or you talk about creative writing or uh, the monomyth and the story stuff always comes up and the video essay is all about the problems with his the way he saw uh, race how he saw women how he saw all of these things that tie into his worldview that are sort of baked into that concept and his uh, his political one ideas um because the story circle generally starts with a uh, uh, protagonist who wants something mm -hmm. the idea is that they go on this journey get what they want it's not what they really wanted they find the thing that they needed mm -hmm. and they arrive back in the back where they started with maybe some sort of revelation about themselves mm -hmm. and recognizing that that's um that's just a story about this you know keeping the status quo as it is and um mm. and it's, it's not it's fairly regressive in that sense and um 
yeah, maybe this is why it's not come up naturally in conversation because I don't really know where I'm going with it. But uh, <laughs> Suzanne, I uh, I realised that it doesn't it doesn't fit into that story structure because mm. and and I was worried a lot of the time when I was writing it about whether I was going off piste too much when it came to um, like traditional methods of storytelling and how you know how things should sort of fit these like three acts uh, structures and how much do you do that with a real person and all of those ideas uh, were swimming around when I was writing it and I just decided this is I think the story this is how mm. it works I think this is how it tackles the themes yeah uh, I guess that the larger point was uh, when people are writing just not to pay as much attention to those um, save the cat kind of um uh those those screenwriting books you know yeah. Like, uh, um, yeah I definitely agree I mean I've read some of those books um and I don't tend to use that that information very much I feel yeah. like elements elements of that might come into the story in places but I've never you know aimed to create three acts or anything <laughs> I feel like if it happens naturally then that's fine but um yeah. yeah and I quite like an open-ended ending um mm -hmm. yeah I quite it makes me think of you know Alex Potts the Avery Hill artist he's done two books with Avery Hill and his 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 storytelling is quite sort of nihilistic and bleak and it's just I, I absolutely love it he just kind of has his he's got one book um it's cold in the river at night and it's about just an unlikable protagonist who learns nothing <laughs> throughout the course of the story <laughs> and I just think things like that are, are so notable because they're so different um and they're quite refreshing to read so yeah you definitely don't need to um get hung up on those ideas of what a story should be I don't think yeah yeah I think if you, your story will just be what it what it is um yeah uh no I, yeah I think I'm glad yeah uh I think they're quite good for giving you a little bit of confidence early doors to think oh this is roughly how mm. it's maybe and then um and then you abandon all the rules as you sort of figure out exactly what you're actually trying to do and uh, say and, yeah, what I think to. I think that the one thing that I found useful is the idea of making the opening of the story like grab you and be quite interesting I think that's a useful <laughs> concept um but I don't tend to worry too much from that point on I think I guess um I definitely think it's fun to think of interesting ways to open a story that might not be just starting at the beginning or whatever um but yeah I definitely agree with you that <laughs> that that it's it's good to sometimes be aware of those things but not to try and slavishly follow them yeah, yeah. um and oh a, a, an obvious final question is um do you know what you're going to be working on next is there another big project in the pipeline yeah I think um I've got a kind of a stop gap idea um before focusing on something like the next kind of long form book um so i i did like a, sh a four page poetry comic um that uh i'll probably you know uh print or put up on on the website like uh in the next month or so and then um i yeah the the idea i think whatever I do next, I think it's going to be like a horror comic. Oh, wow. Um, so... I, that's the sort of uh, an interest of mine alongside tennis that um, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really, um, I don't think I've really had a, a taken a moment to really explore in comics yet. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've, I've had a couple of ideas that I'd like to pursue. And I think I feel like confident enough now to to go full full 100% fiction and um and feel okay about that as well yeah that's exciting um I can't wait to hear more about it in the future um where can people find you online you've got a website I think 
Yes, uh, just tomhumberstone.com and um, I'm at Tom Humberstone on Twitter and Instagram. Cool. Thank you very much for talking to me. I'll put the links under underneath so people can find you and find the book. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for talking to me. It's been really nice. Yeah, no, thank you. Thanks again to Tom for talking to me and thank you for listening.